Hey everyone, this is Joe Minardi and I'm coming to you from the WVU Emergency Medicine Recording Studios to give you a little quick update on using point of care ultrasound during the COVID-19 SARS coronavirus outbreak. I don't have any disclosures. Here's a list of our objectives for the CME. We're going to take a look at what the advantages are and why point of care ultrasound maybe should be our primary imaging modality in these patients. We're gonna talk a little bit about disinfection. We're gonna go a little bit over how to perform the exam, what the imaging findings look like, and then how to incorporate those things into our patient care. So one thing I wanna get off the table right to start with, right at the beginning is no imaging, chest x-ray, point of care ultrasound, any ultrasound, CT scan. Imaging does not make this diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis. Imaging findings may help support or help refute the diagnosis, but they don't make the diagnosis. They can help you define the extent of the disease and maybe suggest an alternate process or an additional process if something else is going on. So keep that in mind with everything else that we're going to talk about as far as the imaging. So part of the rationale for why point of care ultrasound might be the ideal imaging modality is the findings are pretty comparable to what's been described on CT imaging already. Uh, disinfection is much less burdensome for ultrasound than it is for CT scan and requires much fewer staff. Uh, consuming personal protective equipment and things like that. Uh, it, most of the time it can involve the provider who's already taking care of the patient with the ultrasound machine in the room using their PPE they already have on and then just disinfecting the machine kind of before and after the patient. So these are all reasons that it's ideal, not to mention the fact that most of the findings are readily findable with point of care ultrasound. There are two big topics, right? We're going to talk about just using the exam, what are the findings, what does it mean? And we obviously we have to talk about disinfection. So just a quick summary before we get into a lot of details, the findings on ultrasound imaging of the COVID-19 SARS coronavirus is of a bilateral pneumonitis. So when you ultrasound their lungs, you're going to see things like pleural thickening. You're going to see focal and patchy bee lines that have kind of skip areas in them. There are going to be some subpleural lesions, and these may be these are usually fairly small. Um, if they're bigger, it's more severe disease, or if they're really a lot bigger, then maybe you should be thinking about other processes going on. And the findings are more prominent in the lower and posterior lung zones. And here's an example of what some of that may look like. Here we see just a nice focus of bee lines, kind of this waterfall sign underneath the rib shadows, and we see the pleural line here. Here we can see a scattering of bee lines and just thickening and irregularity, kind of choppy looking pleura up here. So those are some of the primary findings there. Here we can see an area of a little bit larger consolidation, some larger subpleural abnormalities, but we still see some increased density and confluent bee lines. Here again we see some pleural irregularities, a little bit of fluid, and kind of patchy skipping around bee lines in the lungs as well. Those are some of the findings. We're going to dive into those in even more detail here a little bit later on. So we've got a case, right? This might be a case that we're going to see. Maybe a 37-year-old female comes in with cough and fever. Just drove to your place from Seattle. Fortunately, you've already got some ideas and some guidelines in place. You've placed this person into isolation as a person under investigation. So now what? So now what is we've got to rewind, right? Because we need to have some things in place, some things planned before this patient ever comes in. So a lot of what you do happens well in advance of these patients ever showing up. So let's talk a little bit about the preparation and the planning of incorporating ultrasound into the evaluation of these patients. So a couple things. You want to probably have some dedicated systems that you know are going to kind of go into your isolation rooms. Uh, maybe you only have one, but you're going to make that system your dedicated system to go into your isolation room. You don't have to dedicate a system. If you have the luxury of having multiple systems, this is going to make it easier. Assuming you follow good disinfection guidelines before and after each use, those systems can then be used in other general areas. But if you have the luxury of a couple of machines, then having one, one or two dedicated just for these patients is going to make your life a little bit easier and just streamline things for people. And then what machines to pick and how to prep them to make it easier to complete disinfection, essentially. So if I was to give you a multiple choice quiz and give you these machines and say, which one do you want to take into your isolation room? Uh, or which ones do you not want to take into your isolation rooms? Which one are you going to pick? Well, clearly you don't want the one with the million buttons and crevices and things that are going to be very hard to disinfect. So if you have the option at all, try to use something that's got these nice flat touchscreen surfaces 
so that you can easily wipe them down. They're much easier to disinfect. Even these still have a lot of undersurfaces and things that are going to be difficult. So make it as easy on yourself as possible and get something that's touchscreen if you have that luxury. If you have something like this, then you're probably going to want to cover most of these things as much as possible with some kind of a plastic bag. Uh, people have even used isolation gowns to wrap them up so that some of these surfaces can be a little bit better protected. This is a nice area where handhelds may be a great option because they have pretty streamlined surfaces. They're small, so much easier to disinfect. So these may be the ideal modality in, in these kind of scenarios. So if you have these, think about making these available and using these for these patients. If you have nurses that are using a machine kind of like this that's a little simpler and more streamlined flat screen for peripheral IVs or pick lines or something like that, you may want to think about commandeering that uh, or uh, nicely requesting that machine from that team for use in these isolated patients. So you have an easier time cleaning these machines and taking care of them. So touch screens are preferred if possible. Handhelds are great options. Avoid buttons and crevices. And if you need to use some kind of a clear removable cover, even gowns have been used. Uh, and then another thing you wanna do before this ever happens is strip everything off that you can. So take away these little carrier trays. If you have a printer, or you're not gonna use that thing, strip that thing off of there and limit yourself to one or maybe two transducers at most so just so you have fewer things to clean and disinfect and potentially become a fomite uh, for example we recently prepped one of ours uh, we've got some different machines we have one like this and we just took everything off it had a printer on the back we took that off this little bucket those are easy to remove take off every non-essential piece so you have fewer surfaces for a virus to attach itself to and you have fewer things to clean after you're finished with your exam. All right, so now back to our patient. So this patient who came in, now they're a person under investigation, what are we gonna do? So we've got our machine, we've chosen it, we've done our homework, we've stripped down all the non-essential parts, we know it's clean, we know it's ready to go into the room, so here we're gonna go. Uh, remember, you're not gonna wanna take reusable gel into that room. Any gel or anything like that you take into the room must never leave that room again. So you want to try to stock up on these reusable gel packs if possible, single-use gel packs, and just take you know two or three of these into the room with you and then you can throw them away and they're disposable and such as fewer things to worry about disinfecting and uh, becoming infected. So covers. A lot of our colleagues in China and Italy have advocated for covers in higher risk situations, maybe where a patient's getting a lot of nebulizers or is on positive pressure ventilation, things like that. Certainly don't see a problem with this. This is not necessarily recommended by the CDC right now, but I can't see any harm in this. So if you have plenty of these covers lying around, feel free to use these if you feel more comfortable. However, uh, based on at least CDC recommendations, a thorough cleansing with an approved disinfectant after use is adequate. Uh, so use your judgment on that. Certainly no one's going to cast stones for uh, using excess barrier protections, assuming that there's enough available, but we are running short, so use these things wisely. So you've got your patient, they're in your isolation room, and you're getting ready to go in. You know you're probably going to want to ultrasound this person, so thing to remember is the machine goes in clean, and it needs to come out clean. And before you leave the room, it needs to undergo disinfection. And hopefully you have your wipes, whichever wipes are approved. There are different wipes for different machines. Mostly in our facilities, we're gonna be using either these Clorox germicidal wipes or the alcohol-free gray top sandy wipes, something like that. Whatever you're using, you wanna make sure you have that ready to wipe down your machine and disinfect your system before you leave the room. So it goes in clean and it comes out clean. So what do we use to clean? Uh, there are a lot of resources for this and there is some variability from machine to machine and manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, most of our hospitals were using the Santa cloth wipes, the gray top alcohol free or preferred for the ultrasound machines because uh, high alcohol concentrations can be can damage our probes, so we want to try to avoid these. Uh, these Clorox germicidal wipes are approved on a lot of machines, so you can use these. They have a short well time. These are nice. Here's the website from the EPA that lists 
the agents that are currently approved in the use against the SARS coronavirus. And this is updated regularly. It's probably not complete because all these things haven't been thoroughly tested and approved up to this minute. But if you have any questions, you may need to consult your local infection control. One important thing is just cleaning this thing means wiping down all surfaces before and after each patient, especially after it's been potentially exposed. That means under surfaces, that means probes, cords, uh, connection ports, touch pads, the back, the front, the under surfaces, the wheel wells, everything. Wipe it down everywhere. And like I said, think about a cover for the probe itself and maybe even covering the machine in higher risk situations. No science on this. This has just been an expert recommendation. All right, so enough about the disinfection parts. Let's talk a little bit about performing the exam. Now, if you've been doing lung ultrasound all along and this is already something you know how to do, then this is going to be pretty easy for you. If lung ultrasound is a little bit new for you, I'm going to go over a little bit of the basic details and reminders just so you can start incorporating this if it's a little bit newer for you. So transducer, and some of this is my preference, I'm pretty much going to use a phased array transducer. And part of that is because to me the heart and the lungs always go together. I almost never ultrasound the lungs without also doing an ultrasound of the heart. And so this is the transducer I'm going to use most of the time. Maybe I would change my practice in you know little kids or other things. Uh, but the beauty of lung ultrasound is really you can use any transducer that you have handy and that you're comfortable with. It should ideally be in a lung setting or respiratory or a pulmonary or whatever your machine has. If you have an older machine that doesn't have lung settings on it, then use an abdominal setting. And if you really want to get fancy and you can find harmonics and spatial compounding and turn those functions off, those are going to help your lung imaging. And you want the depth somewhere between 8 to 16 centimeters, but that'll uh, vary some depending on the size of your patient. And no matter where you are on the patient, pretty much the indicator is going to be directed towards noon, so towards their head. You always want to be perpendicular to their ribs. Now some patients have kind of lumps and bumps and different curves to their body habitus so that their skin and soft tissue maybe isn't exactly perpendicular to their ribs. So you want to make sure that you're always perpendicular to their ribs and always seeing rib shadows and the pleural line sliding. And then you just want to be systematic and cover as much of the lung as you can. And if you've done much lung ultrasound, you've heard about some of these different lung zones breaking up each hemithorax into six zones. It sounds like a lot, but this is such an easy, simple exam you can complete the entire exam in probably about one to three minutes at most. And if you've practiced, uh, definitely you can probably do the whole thing in about a minute. So the way I do this is I just start in the front with the probe kind of up high in the mid line. And then I just kind of do this lawnmower motion kind of slowly because I want to see things changing while the patient's breathing. I don't want to go so fast I miss things. So I'm kind of leisurely lawnmowing my way down the front of their chest and then just saving pictures as I go. Then I work my way out to the side. I start at the bottom because I want to find the diaphragm first and then zigzag my way all the way up into their armpit. And then I do the same thing at the back where I start down low at the diaphragm and then just work my way up. Now remember your window is kind of small up here because you've got the scapula here and the spine so there's really not a lot of space to view the lungs in this upper posterior chest. Now obviously if your patient's a little sicker or more critically ill and isn't able to sit up and cooperate, you may not be able to do these posterior fields. You may have to settle for the anterior and the lateral fields. But just do the best you can, be systematic, and make sure you're seeing rib shadows the entire time. So what does normal lung look like when it's normal? Well not much of anything because normal lung is filled with air. Air just reflects our ultrasound back at us. So, but I want to point out some of the key landmarks. So we want to make sure no matter where we're looking in the lung, we want to see ribs with shadows and we want to see the pleural line sliding. If we're not seeing these things, then our probe is angled off and looking at soft tissue or something else and we're missing what's going on with the lung. So make sure we're seeing rib shadows and pleural sliding. Here we see sliding and the rib shadows are pushed off to the side because of the angle of our probe. And it should look like that pretty much everywhere if it's normal. The one minor exception is when we come to the side, and I think it's very important when we come to these the sides and go posteriorly, we want to identify the diaphragm. So we'll have the probe out here approximately across from the xiphoid. We'll identify the diaphragm here and lung is above and if it's normal it doesn't really look like anything. And then we should also notice the spine which will stop at the diaphragm in normal cases and casting a shadow. So when we come to this side area we'll place the probe, do our little lawnmower all the way up into their armpit 
and then we should see these landmarks in the lung and nothing else again if it's normal. So that's normal. Let's look at the, some of the findings we may see in the SARS coronavirus COVID-19. So the main finding is going to be B lines and these are going to be, we should see them on both sides, but they're going to skip around and they're going to be kind of patchy and have some skip areas. They're not going to be uniform, symmetric and distributed equally across both sides. So here we see a lot of B lines, this pleura, maybe there's a little tiny bit of irregularity. Here we see a little more chopped up and irregular pleura and then intermittent scattered B lines. So just to zoom in on that a little bit more, there we can see that jagged, chewed up, irregular pleura. And these are probably the main hallmark findings, but we'll look at a few other things. So we may see these larger areas of subpleural consolidation and lots more irregularity. And then again, B lines kind of around those. We see probably some of these white dots are air bronchograms and some of that infected lung. Here we see kind of irregular pleura and these choppy irregular B lines and with these pleural irregularities. These are the hallmark findings. Here's a marker of some more severe disease. So we see some B lines, but then we'll see these nasty consolidations in here. Now, just want to break these down for any of you that this is kind of new information for. So what we're seeing here is these are the diaphragms and all this area that looks kind of like liver above here, this is all consolidation. This is what a severe consolidation will look like with any process, including a severe COVID-19 infection. These little white dots in here, these are air bronchograms. Remember air on ultrasound is white. And then I'll point out here that when we have these abnormalities in the lung, like fluid or big consolidations, we see the spine continuing up into the chest, which normally we can't see because the normal aerated lungs block our view of the spine. So that's what those can look like if it's really severe, and just to see those again in real time, how they move. Very severe consolidations that could be due to a patient with COVID-19 infection. These are some other examples. I want you to see a lot of examples of this. This is from Rebel EM. So just showing again lots of uh, B lines, this big waterfall sign of B lines that are confluent, a little consolidation where it's very chewed up, and this is a little bit larger consolidation. And remember, with COVID-19, this is a pneumonitis, so you're going to see some findings on both sides, but they're probably not going to be symmetric. These are some great videos taken from the Butterfly website, courtesy of Mike Stone. So we'll see, as he's pointing out here, we see these B lines with some skip areas, some thickened pleura. Here we see a larger consolidation, and this is all confluent bright white B lines underneath here. Similar finding here where we've got these B lines and skip areas, uh, not as severe in this case, little minor plural irregularities. So these are all consistent with what we might see in COVID-19. Now remember, these are nonspecific and can occur with any other pneumonitis, so we have to incorporate this into the whole clinical picture. So just Again, summarizing, it's a bilateral pneumonitis, so you should see findings on both sides. And these findings are all nonspecific. They all have to be incorporated to the whole clinical picture, but you're going to see pleural thickening, focal patchy B lines with kind of skipped out areas, and you may see some subpleural lesions, some of which may be larger. And there's going to be more of this in the posterior and lower regions of the lungs. So if you can, your patient is well enough to let you get access to those areas, those are going to be your high yield areas. So imaging decisions, there has been certainly some discussion and description of findings on CT as well as x-ray. Uh, what I want to say again is no imaging, ultrasound, CT, x-ray, none of them diagnose this. They can help us define the extent of the disease. They may help us risk stratify them, although that's not well defined yet. It's all too new, but also may suggest alternate processes to make take you maybe in another direction. So keep that in mind. No imaging makes the diagnosis. Uh, this is a paper that was put out from our colleagues in China that just was kind of showing the ultrasound correlates of some of the CT findings. And if you look at this, uh, most of these findings can be recognized on ultrasound that can be seen on CT. And at least in most 
other lung ultrasound applications, pretty much every lung finding of pneumonitis, pneumonia, pleural effusion, pneumothorax, everything else has all been documented to be more accurate with lung ultrasound than chest x-ray alone. Uh, and somewhere in between, and in some cases nearly approaching the sensitivity of CT scan. For this specific process, we don't know that, but, but extrapolating what we know from other pulmonary processes, it seems like it's probably reasonable to go with lung ultrasound as the primary imaging modality. Uh, this is another imaging suggested. Again, this is not validated. These are just suggested algorithms, but this fits kind of my perspective is start with ultrasound, maybe at least initially a chest x-ray to help you see maybe some of the hyalur areas that aren't as well visualized with ultrasound. And just go through this really simply. If both x-ray and lung ultrasound are negative, um, then you know they, they're probably fine to go home. I'm going to guess they're going to look good clinically as well, and you probably don't need to do much else. Uh, over here at this other extreme, you see findings on both x-ray and lung ultrasound, and you probably have a diagnosis. You probably don't need to do much more unless you really think there's something that's going to change the way you're going to manage this person. And then these people in the middle where maybe the x-ray and the ultrasound don't match up, maybe you want to CT those people. But again, if you have a strong clinical diagnosis otherwise, then the CT scan is unlikely to change your management in these patients because mostly it's going to be supportive care anyway, and you're going to make your decisions based on the overall clinical picture, how sick they are, plus your imaging findings. So I think it's honestly again, this is my opinion to some degree, going to be rare where CT scan is going to help you significantly in COVID-19 patients. Noting, as we've mentioned, none of these imaging modalities diagnose the disease itself. So just to review a few other findings that if you see these, you should start thinking in other directions, that there's something more going on or something different going on. So if you see B lines and they are in a very consistent distribution and they're very symmetric on you know, both sides look about the same, they're very uniform, you're not seeing a lot of skip areas or a lot of patchiness to the distribution of these things, you're not seeing subpleural lesions, so the pleural line is pretty clean, then you need to think something else. You need to think this is pulmonary edema which means you should probably check their heart. Could be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, but you should probably check their heart. And I'm going to say it's a whole different topic, but I'm going to recommend anybody that's warrants evaluating their lungs, you're in the room, you're already donning PPE, you might as well take a look at their heart and look at everything you can look at while you're there and not have to come back and do it again. If you see something like this over here on your left, so this is a large pleural effusion. And over here, this is just nasty, strandy, complex, disgusting empyema. So large pleural effusions have been reported in the reports we have so far to be pretty rare with COVID-19. So if you see a large pleural effusion, you should start thinking mm, there's something else going on or maybe that this is you know from a prior disease process. And if you see something like this big empyema, then there's obviously more going on or this is a very complex case. So these are, again, just some findings that should maybe lead you in a little bit of a different direction. So just in summary, you got to be prepared. So be ready to deal with this before it hits your door. And that means have a stripped down machine, preferably a touch screen model if possible. Handhelds may be ideal. The machine goes in clean and it comes out clean and everything that goes in otherwise like gel and things like that are hopefully disposable. The findings, it's a bilateral pneumonitis, so focal patchy B lines and pleural thickening and abnormalities. Consider some of the other things you see like large pleural effusions or empyemas and consider looking at their heart in all of these patients so you don't get locked in and miss other things that are going on with these patients. Uh, here are some other references. There are some great folks. Uh, collaborating across the globe to put out up to the minute information. So keep your eyes posted for that kind of thing. Uh, here's my contact info. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or any additions. And if you're having cases and you have questions, you can send them to me and let us know how it's going out there. Thanks a lot for your time and I'll see you soon.